they basically made the call, we're going to have to step up here. We're going to have to leave or things are just going to continue to get worse. So they formed a regional housing initiative to effectively say, well, what are the things we can do? What are the levers we can control that will start to make systemic changes and introduce new models that will actually produce different outcomes? We can't just keep doing the same thing and, and hope that uh, somehow affordability will arrive or increasing technology will arrive. In this interview with Axel Beck, we are tackling housing unaffordability and the levers within legislation, policy, and at the local government level that we have available to us to be able to make great effect. So he was just referring to the Waikato Housing Initiative, which is a collaboration of all the different councils within that Waikato region, where they came together to create a local strategy around how to tackle the regional housing crisis. So I reached out to Axel because he and I care deeply about addressing this housing unaffordability problem. And we believe that dealing with it at the local level, rather than waiting for central government to create these solutions or social housing or the market, we believe that there's another way. We talk about the uh, policy called inclusionary zoning, where local government, it is something that they can do to make uh, land more available for affordable housing. We talk about about the community land trust as a means of creating that housing to be perpetually affordable. We talk about the housing initiative and how that came to be and the goals and what it has achieved to date. We also talk about Axel's background growing up in Denmark and how that has influenced how he understands housing differently uh, than it is currently done here, which has a more collective or community-led approach to it and how he thinks more in terms of neighborhoods than he does just about housing. And I really want to make these models of tackling it from a collaborative approach as well as a policy approach available to everyone. So I look forward to inviting you into this interview with Axel. Just visit the show notes to get all the links and resources that we have available to you. Kia ora and welcome to The Homefulness Show. I'm your host, Zola Rose, located in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We believe housing can be a means for regenerative placemaking to create affordable and sustainable homes and neighborhoods developed in collaboration with the communities that live there. We'll be exploring different housing models and neighborhood designs and innovation in energy, water waste, construction, land use, and food systems. We showcase housing policies, finance, funding, and community engagement to unlock this potential. This show aims to empower you with knowledge, resources, and networks to support you in creating great places to live. Come join us as we bring to life the more beautiful housing that we know is possible. Kia ora. Welcome, Axel, to the Common Ground podcast and YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us today from the abundant breadbasket Waikato in the north island of Aotearoa. And I'm uh, zooming in from the top of the south, Te Ihu uh, of Aotearoa. And so I invited you today because you've doing amazing work with the Waikato Housing Initiative. And I've just heard about the inclusionary zoning that has come about with the YPOD district. But I thought to give a little bit of the background of how we've come to know each other. So I used to live up in Hamilton as of about two years ago. And housing quickly became my interest, one, because as a new migrant in 2016, I was myself quite influenced by a lot of the housing challenges. I then became a single mother of two teenagers and was even more impacted by the housing challenges. But then as my role as community development practitioner with Shama, which is an ethnic women's center, I really was then looking at anything to do with community-led development. And so I decided to look at housing and how housing was affecting everything and how could a community-led development approach be part of the solution of what we throw into the mix? Because I wasn't seeing it. I was seeing social housing. We saw market housing, and that's where a lot of the problems that we see leaving most people as it climbs into unaffordability. And so I was really then identifying that that community-led aspect of housing had a real opportunity to, to be explored. 
And so then I started showing up to housing discussions that were happening in the region and being the lone voice in the room saying, hey, what about community led housing? And what about the diversity? Like I was finding diversity was quite missing. We were talking about really people very much in need at the bottom end of the cliff of, of survival. And then we were, you know, trying to figure out how to deal with this market but we were having this missing middle conversation not really represented at the table. So I was showing up to all these different meetings around housing. And then around that time, I guess the Waikato Housing Initiative was getting formed and starting to take some shape. I was trying to support an eco-village in Ragland. If you remember meeting Nadine Simsar, who was really trying to bring in this regenerative discussion around housing, eco-village, and you were at the time deputy mayor. And so we were seeing you as a um, instrumental role player to include in these discussions. And then I saw you recently when I came up for the enabling housing for ethnic women. And I was talking about how we need to also have a discussion around housing for women, which there's a lot of initiatives overseas that are happening. I brought a lot of those case studies to then share and open up a dialogue around how would housing look like if we put women at the center of that discussion, not meaning solely exclusively for women, but we just centered them and their needs and their aspirations. So thanks for participating and coming to that workshop. So tell us about your upbringing and particularly around housing and community. And what was that like? And how how have you found that cultural influence of growing up the way you did influence anything to do with your housing and community work today? Mm. That's a, a big opening <laughs> way to start. Thank you for that. Uh, kia ora. Um, yeah, so it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because housing is always there. And as a child, you don't think about it. It's just where you live. Hopefully, you do have somewhere to live. Hopefully, you are part of a community. Hopefully, you're close to family and what we might call amenities now as adults. But as kids, it's just, can you run and meet your friends at a park? You know, type of that sort of stuff. Is there a library? Is there a pool? So, yeah, housing is really at the core of, of our sort of lived experience. We are a herd animal. We live in communities, and housing is, is a kind of intrinsic part of supporting that. So when our families and, our, and individuals, for that matter, too, within our communities can't access housing that meets their needs, it actually translates into a whole range of different issues, not just to do with shelter. There's a whole range of, of issues, let alone the cultural overlay, that say we need a, a quite a diverse range of topology to be delivered, not all three or four bedroom homes with two ensuites, which is what we uh, seem to be very good at building uh, in the free market, because that's what sells, right? Mm. Um, so yeah, so we're all shaped by, you're right, by our lived experience. I was born in Denmark. I was uh, raised there until the age of 14. So my teenage years were in that sort of Scandinavian context, and Andrew's journey is different, but my parents split up when I was about five. As a solo mum, my mother did what lots of solo mums do, I guess, is you look at family first until you get yourself sorted out. So we lived with my grandmother for quite a while, mm-hmm. and, then, and then with my uncle. Interesting enough, my grandmother's house first was actually a, a, a kitset type of home, a modular home because it was built between the World Wars or just after the Second World War. And Denmark, you know, coming out of the war, had a great deal of limited supplies, limited access to a whole lot of materials. Kit sets came out of Finland, actually. They milled the mm. pine trees, the logs up there, and a house lot of materials, which got sent down to, to Denmark for people actually to build themselves, largely, or with the help of friends, you know. So that's where my grandmother lived from the 40s, uh, through to her death. Then we moved into an apartment building, which was a built, what now we call a built to rent. So the council owned and run built to rent, not council flats in the sense that they were supported, but councils in Scandinavia anyway tend to be the largest landlord. They are the ones that mm. provide apartments, which you can never ever buy. They're there to be leased and people live in mm. them for sometimes decades, sometimes just a few years, depending on their circumstances. So as your mm. needs change, that's another typology that's there and available. Yeah, so eventually with the new new family, my mother remarried. We came to New Zealand when I was a, a teenager. And I, I guess I'm probably more a Kiwi now than I am Danish. But, you know, some of my housing ideas, I guess, were shaped by, by that mm-hmm. um, initial context. Uh, and then, yes, in New Zealand, we lived in a range of 
dwellings too, I suppose, although mostly whenever you rent, it's actually a family home, something that's built as a three or four bedroom family home that is then rented uh, for a different purpose, whether it's to a family or it's to three or four students. Mm. Yeah, we don't we don't have that same sort of tradition of building something that is for the purpose of, of being rented. Um, and you know, very difficult to get one and two bedroom places, very difficult to get more than five bedrooms. So we've ended up in the market here in New Zealand, effectively not building to rent, but building to own occupy, even if it's not actually built, like an investor could build it, but they'll still build it as own occupied type typology. And, you know, we've not been very good at those different sorts of models of secure tenure, which when you look at the UN type definitions of uh, the right to shelter, it is really about security of tenure. Now, it doesn't talk so mm -hmm. much to ownership. It just talks to somewhere that you know is it's your home and you're not going to get thrown out. Your, your child can attend the local school. You can actually invest in that community, become part of the community mm -hmm. because you're going to be there for as long as it suits your needs. That's something we're not really good at in this country, but we need those new models of of secure tenure, which might also be ownership. It's another model of secure tenure, provided you can pay the mortgage. But yeah, as a teenager, grew up in Hawke's Bay, down to Massey for, for university, and then through the working life, uh, have lived in the Waikato and Gisborne and Kirikiri, Bay of Islands. So there's sort of a few different, kind of a, a provincial tour of the North Island. <laughs> But have uh, generally stayed away from the, the cities, I guess, um, preferring the more sort of the smaller type community that has the benefits of uh, larger towns, but more mm. cities. I met my wife at Massey and uh, married with three teenage kids, or one's actually just turned 20, so two teenagers still at home. Oh, nice. I've also got a 20 year old and an 18 year old. And uh, just your thoughts on like neighborhoods. I don't know whether you got that feeling in Denmark, whether that was anything culturally significant, that neighborhood, rather than talking about houses. Did you get a feeling that there was more of a sense of a neighborhood where you were living? And has, how has that influenced your thinking around housing as well? And raising your children, has neighborhood rather than house come into your thinking yeah. around how that could make it easier or it's made it more pleasant? Well, look, I'll come back to the community comment. Um, but we've got a, a word in, in Danish, fællesskab, which is sort of the word for collective, but it's also for together or for mm -hmm. collaboration. or like It has a whole range of meanings of, of things you do collectively, things you do together. I think inherent in that, the thing that makes Scandinavian societies maybe a little bit different is that there is a, a strong sense of the collective. It's actually, it's, it's in the constitution as well. It, it talks about, because we came out of a, a monarchy type system and going into a democracy, that whole idea of the collective was actually talked about in the constitution itself. The importance of contributing what you can, what you're able to. Because it's, as you know, with a very high sort of safety net in terms of social security and, and a quite a high tax rate as a result, it's important that people don't free ride on that. Everyone has to contribute to the way that they can in order for us collectively to move forward. That's an inherent mm. uh, build, building block in that sort of approach, as opposed to the pure kind of capitalistic, if you do well, good for you. And if you don't do so well, well, that sucks to, sucks to be you. That's a different way to go. And it doesn't require a, a collective focus quite the same way. It's mm -hmm. more of an individualistic sort of focus. So I know your area, of course, of interest, collective housing, co-housing, that's very much in Denmark too, where there's a lot of sort of building societies or co-ops and what you like, but, you know, where the people themselves actually set the rules, I suppose, and, and there are very strict regulations about them being not for profit in the food. So they're, mm. they're there as a, an ongoing way to provide not just shelter, but, but a kind of a community based, a collective based way of living. And in terms of us raising our children, we've always looked to, to live in a community where we connect on the street, at the school, through whether it's standing next to each other on the sports ground or whether it's going on to the board of trustees or whether it's getting involved in the PTA, all that sort of stuff is part of community and like being present in the community that you live, helping your neighbour and just doing stuff together. And like in this street here, we're just on the edge of Hamilton, just in the southern edge of Hamilton. We still have a street barbecue once or twice a year just to keep connected. And that's mm. an important part of why we've chosen to live here. Oh, nice. 
Yeah, it isn't that an intentional community has to be that from the get go, it's really that it's fostered in some way by people who are living there. And obviously right. security, as we were saying from the beginning of the conversation, if people can be in place without the fear of needing to move on, they can really put down the roots, have these conversations and knowing they can build on those relationships. So yeah, intentionality yeah. happens over time, but it doesn't yeah. happen over time if there's too much shifting around. No. Yeah. So that's a core cool part of it. But you're right too. And maybe I, I, I glossed over that. But but in, when you have increasing density then when you come into a more urban form or a city sort of environment, you probably need to have more intentionality right from the beginning. Mm. You actually need to to think about the design of what you're doing in order to to foster, promote, try and, and give opportunity, try to give space for those connections to then happen later. You can't you can't force them to happen. If you genuinely don't want to have anything to do with your neighbours, it's quite possible to do that, I guess. But you need to intentionally design opportunities for that. When I was in council, so I spent six years in, in Waikato District Council, and we actually had that opportunity because of growth to think about master plan communities, whole mm. new towns mm -hmm. that were being, well, still continue to be creative in places like Pukeno, Tuakau, yet to come uh, to Kalfuda, places like that, there's whole new communities, towns of, of, of kind of going from 500 to 10,000 people over, over a decade. So to get the design right, it's really important. It's not just about getting maximum yield of the number of sections you can get in there. It's actually thinking about how people are going to live there, how people are going to connect, how people are going to be proud of where they live, be proud to offer their best contribution to, to making it livable. Uh, quite influenced actually in, in that particular regard by Jan Gell, G E H L, so mm -hmm. Danish architect who gave a lot of thought to this. So he actually talks about the spaces between the buildings, mm -hmm. like this sort of communal life happens in the spaces in between. So you can have, as an architect, you can focus very much on what the inside of your apartment looks like or does the building function well in terms of. So you've got somewhere to dispose of your waste and accessibility and elevators and sunlight, all that sort of stuff. But actually, it's the spaces between the buildings where community happens. So you need to, as an architect, as thesis is, to spend as much time, maybe more time, actually, thinking about the spaces between, because that's where life happens. That's the, where you linger. That's where you meet with your neighbours. That's where the kids kick a ball around. Really yeah. Important. So we took that on board at Waikato District when we were thinking about a developer saying, hey, here's my really cool master plan development. I'd like to do X, Y, Z. You then have to look at it through that lens to say, yeah, but what do you mm -hmm. want to live here? Is it that all of these lovely green areas that you're showing in your development are actually just the swales that are required for stormwater? Or are mm -hmm. they actually a, a functional green space that you can use? But yeah, that's you're absolutely on the money. We need to think about well, how, how people live. Well, that's it. Yeah. Well, there's a, when you were saying sort of the lens by which you can look at a plan, you can look at it in many different ways. Uh, profit, how much profit can I get out of this or how much permeable space? And if we're really doing the bare minimum, that's all we're looking at it. But if we're overlaying a lens of, so what's the bumping space? What's that edge that people have to play in? Where's the food growing spaces? There's a lovely philosophy called permaculture. One of the principles of permaculture is using the edge and valuing the marginal. So again, if you were looking at this plan through this lens of valuing the edge and the edges of the homes and between the spaces, yeah, asking those really important questions as to what's the value bring to here, we have a whole different way of valuing that community and whether it's going to be in the end sort of like a, like a dormitory community or right. pe people yeah. just go to sleep and then their life actually happens somewhere else versus whether we've got a real living system yeah, yeah, and so, it's so. overlaying that whole living system paradigm and there's different questions that we can be asking what are the elements that make this a truly great living system and a regenerative living system not just one that's going to get by with how we are now, but that makes us either resilient for the future or even more abundant and thriving into the future. Mm. And that's one thing I'd really like to see more of in councils is what are the lenses that we're using mm. to evaluate how we do plans, how others submit to us and how we're able to 
to look at through those other lenses rather than that regulatory tick boxing minimum requirements. Yeah, that's right. When we think about the way in which we've developed the model of how you do towns, right? So that fits into the Town and Country Planning Act that the UK still works to, right? So you start with a square in the middle and you've got a post office and a church and a council office and a something or other else, pub probably. And then you go out in a grid-like thing and when you've gone so many out, then you need another park and then you need a school. So we, we threw all of that out and we went to an RMA format, which says basically, hey, if you're not harming somebody else, essentially you should be allowed to do it. Right, it's an effects based. So we lost all of those learnings. The, and the effect. pattern as well. Like, what's the meaning right. of the pattern? How does the yeah. pattern then translate into right. the kinds of outcomes we want? Yeah, because we have 2,000 years of experience of that pattern works, right? But then we went to the sort of other model where possibly the lens of how many sections can I get out of this development became important and I don't want to make developers out as bad guys right because and this is a really important point when we look at new dwellings being built up here in the Waikato anyway about well less than 10 percent is built by the government through Kainora, the chips and a few other charities and so on it's less than 10 percent of the market 90 percent of new dwellings are delivered by private developers so if we want more dwellings to come to the market affordable of the right type you know warm dry all of those things who who are we going to ask to build those we're going to ask the 10 percent we're going to ask the 90 percent right if you want bang for bucks you're going to need to work with the 90 percent that's where you're going to get change happening the fastest and let's be honest councils aren't used to developing at scale it's not a core set of competencies that they have so if we ask them to build all of this new housing that we need they're probably not doing a great job of it much better off to go to the developers for whom this is their core business but applying different lenses changing the settings mm -hmm. to change the outcomes that we want at the other end so we sort of lost our connection to what we knew worked and these new lenses i think are important because the system now is broken like it's not delivering the right topology in the right places or at the right price but the system is not through anybody's fault it's more through kind of abandoning the things when you worked and then through various tax incentives effectively capital gains as is not an interesting topic in its own right the absence of it and and moving to an effect space regulatory system we've lost mm -hmm. track of that hey you should do it this way because it's livable whereas it's always been my belief that for it's actually in the developer's interest if you build a really cool community that people want to live that people can see it's going to meet their needs in a whole lot of ways, including that connected community experience. You can probably charge a little bit than the sleeper town development that's just down the road because it's going to be a, a nicer place to live, a safer place to live that commands a higher price. I don't think we're not asking developers to subsidize something. I think smart design, clever design that actually speaks to the human experience of using those spaces afterwards in itself will uh, bring the reward with it, will bring the, the price, the margin with it. Mm. Well, that was the other thing around having these conversations, but we're asking them to, to build something they don't think there's a market for. And actually there is, there's so many people that are desiring this. So I'm quite interested to have a lot more conversations around if it could be possible that you could have this, would you choose it? Because a lot of people don't know what they don't know. If they haven't been outside of the country and experienced other housing topologies, they might not know that they could even ask for such a thing. So having these conversations for people who are able to express the kinds of housing that they would prefer so that developers and those who are in charge of approving um, that process can actually say, yes, there is actually a lot of demand. People are waiting. This is what culturally is needing to be offered because the the interest, the demand is there. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, but there's sort of two elements of that. One is that a developer, if you go and buy something, a section and ask them to build something, they will absolutely build what you commission. There's no developer who's going to say, look, I'm not going to build that, right? The problem is when they spec build it, when they build it without a particular customer in mind, they're going to default to what they think is most easily going to sell with a good margin. And that's been that three or four bedroom home with a rotary clothesline at the back and a lemon tree at the front. You know, that's our traditional sort of view of what a home should be. 
but if you commission it it will be built right so the problem is in some ways is we haven't commissioned the right sort of homes the other aspect of it though is the affordability train that's well and truly mm -hmm. left the station so even if you were to go and say hey listen i'd want you to build me this and the builder says that's cool and it's going to be eight hundred thousand at the end of it whoops that's a different problem right because now it's the perfect answer to to what i need but i can't afford it and that's where we come into some of the interventions that we are looking for for example with inclusionary zoning and the lands trust where basically land is about half the cost um, of a new dwelling um, so if you can treat that in a different way uh, all of a sudden that eight hundred thousand dollar home is a four hundred thousand dollar home but in a, some version of leasehold yeah. and so do you want to take us back and just say sure. so how, how it's been working because i'm looking at this is a model that I think can be replicated around the country. So really we're Absolutely. we're trying to help people to understand what is this initiative about? How could it be replicated in other areas? What's working well? What could be done or better? Or what are you working towards? And then we can talk about some of the nuances of that. I'd like to take a brief moment to share with you about Common Ground, the consulting agency to provide professional services to enable more affordable, socially connected, resilient, and climate adaptive housing and neighborhood development and place-based living. So Common Ground works with local government, with community housing providers, with for-purpose developers, and with groups of people wishing to lead their own housing initiatives. We provide services in housing strategy, design and facilitation of meaningful community engagement, research, policy development, training in new approaches to better housing outcomes. We also provide services in workplace culture and communication to create more cohesive and effective working teams and workplaces. So why work with Common Ground? Well, we take a whole systems and innovative approach we have decades of experience in community and regenerative development. We have compassionate work culture. We're aligned with community engagement best practices of IAP2. Our knowledge is research-based, and we work with a spirit of joy, creativity, and collaboration. You can visit our website at commonground.net.nz to learn more about our services, to get two reports that we've written on housing for women, and the Community Land Trust model, and please sign up for our weekly newsletter for inspirational resources, links to case studies that showcase successful initiatives and policies, and get announcements to upcoming events. So I guess that the bottom line here is that for about three or four de decades, different governments came and went, and our settings drove us to where we are now. And we all sat around and watched it like some sort of slow motion train wreck. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. And in amongst it all, I think we were waiting for government to come and save us. You know, government effectively, and I'm talking about governments of either flavor right through through this whole period, they basically changed settings and, and the levers so that we got to this point of unaffordability now. We could see that we're in the communities, we're much closer to the communities that are hurting. And we were waiting for them to kind of realize it and fix it. And about seven years ago, through the mayoral forum here in the Waikato, so 11 different mayors, 11 councils all together, they basically made the call, the government's not going to come. You know, there's no white horse coming over the, the, the horizon here to save us. We're going to have to step up here. We're going to have to leave or things are just going to continue to get worse. So they formed a regional housing alliance or initiative to effectively say, well, what are the things we can do? What are the levers we can control that will start to make systemic changes? So not individual one project or one development, but systemic changes and introduce new models that will actually produce different outcomes. We can't just keep doing the same thing and, and hope that uh, somehow affordability will arrive or increase in topology will arrive. It clearly hasn't. It's not going to, right? So we need to we need to grab control. It took a number of years to sort of agree on on exactly what the levers were that we could affect. 
what our appetite was, what the outcomes of some of those interventions might be. Are they the right outcomes or do they create a, you know, a different sort of problem? All of that sort of stuff. And through that time, and you were part of those earlier meetings, and that's when I was in local government. So I was there with a the governance oversight uh, of the Regional Housing Initiative through that period. And basically about a year ago, it was like, right, we know what we're doing. We know what some of the, not all the solutions, but some of the solutions that can pretty immediately start to make an impact. We know what they are. Let's get on with it. And that's the point at which I got appointed. So I've just come out of local government at that point. So I stepped into the role of CE. And basically it moved from a group of, kind of a coalition of the willing, but all volunteers, into having uh, some actual resource, some executive staff to, to really have an action sh mode shift uh, and, and put some of those things into a feed. Um, big focus initially is councils because they control a lot of the levers, but it is a whole of continuum thing. You can't just tweak one bit. You know, you have to have the whole of the continuum in mind. And specifically, we are looking at, at the bit around what we call affordable housing. Yeah, so basically, if you think of, of the housing continuum as being sort of on the left-hand side, uh, what you might call social housing. So this, these yeah. are things that largely the government or community housing providers do. Uh, and there will be a, a large degree or possibly an entire subsidy or financial support from government itself or another agency. So that's your emergency housing, motels and that sort of thing, transitional housing, and then public housing or social housing. At the, at the other end of the, of the continuum, we've got the free market. So that's rentals that I've just been offered on Trade Me or wherever, or, or houses for sale. And people go to the bank or do whatever, and they just access those directly themselves. There's a big gap in the middle, and that's the gap that hasn't been built for 30 years or nowhere near the quantity that's required. And there's actually, when you zoom in on that, there's a lot of different things within it, a lot of different models within it. But just sort of broadly speaking, you go from some degree of assistance through to very little. So it's a kind of a, a progression of, of uh, perhaps income-related rent support or some other government assistance or maybe through a charity that sees rentals being subsidised a little bit. There might be progressive home ownership, so you might start building up your own equity over time, as well as different ways of getting into it to share, different models of shared mm -hmm. equity in effect through that range. Lots of different models within it. But that's that's effectively the box we're trying to affect is just that bit there. Collective housing is also another example of, of a way to produce a more affordable product within that part of the spectrum. But at the moment, if you're sitting in an emergency motel, which is, you know, is a, is a blight on on all of us actually that by now are there for not just the days or weeks, but actually many months. Kids are growing up playing in motel car parks. It's a, it's a complete disgrace. They've got to get moved through to some sort of social housing, a public house, going aura type house. But where do they go after that? I mean, what, how do you get from a going aura house to an $800,000 free market house? Very, very difficult. People who are not necessarily in need of that, but people who are working, a working couple, for example, just your average, like a teacher and a, and a nurse or whatever, you know, they are actually struggling to to rent, <laughs> let alone to save for a deposit, given how high the rents are, to save for a deposit and get on the housing ladder. So they're too well off, we can put it that way, to, to get assistance from the government, but they're excluded from the free market in terms of purchasing unless there's a mum and a dad somewhere in behind who can who can help with the deposit and they'll end up in this awful trap where their rent might be higher than a mortgage repayment would be but they can't access that so they're excluded from that ownership path or even secure tenure because even though they can afford to pay the rent perhaps in the free market at some stage the landlord decides that they now want to sell that particular investment property because it is just an investment house so sorry but you've got to go or they need it for a different purpose so there's there's very little ability to sort of form that secure tenure uh, mm -hmm. that we hope for in the prison model we need a lot more product 
in that affordable space in order to promote these these better outcomes longer term and just for there to be a pathway that gets you into the, the free market. Mm. And that's where the WHI is working. So would you say mostly an advocacy or would you say education advocacy, educating around the different topologies and how this terminology is what they really mean when you unpack them? And then who are you advocating to? Who, where's this messaging yeah. going? Who are you trying to influence? Sure, yeah. So so mandate comes out of a mirror forum, right? So effectively councils. And and I would say we're 90% advocacy. So we, we're never, ever going to build anything. It's all about advocating for system change that actually sees different outcomes coming. And I can share a, actually a second graphic here just to, to illustrate that point. So we, pretty early in our time, basically worked out that there were three big rocks to, to address in order to, to have that system change. Issues around land, the zoning of land, the, the servicing of land, you know, free water servicing and so on. There's a whole lot of stuff tied up with land itself. Funding. Funding is another big hurdle that needs to be overcome, whether you're the developer, whether you're a chip, whether you're a, a private private person. There's a whole lot of, of issues around the way that our systems are funded, including, for example, for a developer who needs to pay for free water infrastructure to be rolled out. It's a massive cost up front. And that adds to the cost of a section, which adds to unaffordability. Uh, and then there's a range of policy regulations that, that also add to ability, often not intentionally. The rules are there for a different reason, but they've ended up adding to ability. So those are the three areas in which we advocate. And we do have to keep the whole of continuum in mind. But initially, our, our advocacy work has been directed towards councils. So really looking at councils to do the things that they can do because they've got their hands on more levers than anybody. Not so much in the funding area, but in the land and the policy and regulation area. They really control a lot of the levers there. And it doesn't need uh, legisl legislative change for them to adopt a different approach. You know, look at it through a different lens and go, oh, actually, we could be more enabling here. Absolutely. Because I've done a lot of research in terms of other countries and how the local government has done a lot of enabling, moving away from re only regulating to really what are the enabling and what are the experimental things that they can do as well. So if, for instance, one Canadian town that I was looking at, the people wanted to do an urban eco village. So it's just on the edge of the town. It wasn't zoned as such at all. They had some commercial stuff. They had some food growing and animals. And it was really co a comprehensive little village, but it was there in a zone that was not originally zoned as such. But they had the vision and they worked with the council, I believe over a period of about five years to mm -hmm. rewrite the zoning to enable an eco-village zone. And so I've actually got the planning document that right. that council has created where they have outlined an eco-village zone that all these things would be allowed. And that's really exciting to see that a council where that nothing existed like that before, mm -hmm. they created a whole new zone and a whole new community type that was really meeting the need of a bunch of people there w with that collaboration between the community of people who wanted that and, and the council who was willing to create that. And I've seen that again with the tiny homes in Atlanta, Georgia, there's a nonprofit called Microlife. And they sort of form that bridge building between the council, which is that holder of policy as it is currently, with the need for there to be tinier homes and infill spaces where maybe it would only be zoned for one or two houses, but they want six cottages as they call them. And right. they've worked with the council to do an experiment. Okay, we're gonna try this lot here to put the six cottages with some common space in between. The council said, wow, that really worked well. We like that. All right, let's do it in another infill space. And then right. Microlife is taking their methodology of how they're marrying what is the current need with policy that's outdated with the council who's willing to do that rewriting and experimenting with new forms. So that's exactly yeah. what you're talking about. And that's the power of this housing initiative, because it's not an individual like me saying, well, I see the need. Can't you rewrite policy? Mm -hmm. You know, who am I? <laughs> but when you yeah. have an initiative that's mayoral, 
and that's made up of a bunch of experts as well who've got a property background, law and, and governance and things like that, who are saying we need to try something different with policy, all of a sudden, absolutely, let's try it. Yeah, and what it takes is for councils to say, oh, so that's our job. We can be enabling. We can choose to do this. Mm -hmm. We don't need the central government to change uh, the law. We actually have the power already to set regulation, and this is still within the parameters of what we can choose to do. We just hadn't thought of it before. We just hadn't thought of it. So that's the big change. That's the advocacy role. And you're right, Tiny Homes is a, is a perfect example. And we're struggling with that. Council by council, they've all got different attitudes and approaches, right? Um, and, and it is a, a bit of a um, dilemma because on the one hand, uh, there's no doubt that by having it on wheels, there's been a deliberate attempt to say, ah, council, you can't regulate these because it's a movable structure and it's a bit like a caravan, so you can't tell me where to park, which is gets around a whole lot of the, the rules and regulations that, that add uh, to the affordability problem, like makes things unaffordable, so you can understand why. On the other hand, when you actually have a community of those or a number of them within an existing community, Actually, those people living in, in, within that still should be part of the broader community. They should still hold their heads up high and walk into the library or play in the local park or access other amenities. And those things are funded by the community itself. So when, you, when you're not captured by rates in some way or contribute in some other way, then actually you're kind of freeloading a little bit as well. So that's why councils are antsy about it. Everyone should contribute to the local hall and the local park. That's fair. Otherwise, council can't maintain it or improve it uh, as more people uh, move in. So it's about finding the way that correctly captures that and treats it in the right way. And that's, I would say, is very much a moving space still. It's, it's difficult. Sanitary issues is another one. Councils would prefer everyone was nicely connected to a, to a septic system rather than not sure what you're doing, <laughs> particularly when it becomes of a sort of a more permanent nature. So whether there's a, a, a commonly like a septic tank sort of scenario that's run as a community or whether you connect to council pipes, either either way, it's a more formal system rather than each tiny home having to find its own solution and some maybe doing that in a less appropriate way than others. So there is a tension there, but I think we'll, we'll, it is a model that is here already and by kind of not acknowledging it, we're leaving behind a valuable other model that is part of those new models we've said we need. Mm. And so just to bring in another consideration, which is the regulating factor, and quite often we've only known social, which is nonprofit, and market. And so we, if we don't recognize this third sector as a non-speculative or not-for-profit, it's not charity because it doesn't, it's not registered as a community housing provider. So I guess it must fit into this market, in which case we're going to use all the same. It costs this much to apply for this. And if, if there's six of you, it'll cost six times that. Or there's a development contribution now. Even though your house is only 30 square meters, you still have to pay the development contribution. And so we've got yeah. regulations that are not fit for purpose. So they're trying to put on an expensive regulatory process onto something where people are just barely managing to afford the structure that they're in. They need to put it somewhere. And that's, I think, why there's that missing legitimacy is because there's they, they don't have a languaging to go to council and say, look, we are different. We're non-speculative. Please don't apply your market costs to, uh, yes, of course, we need to talk about wastewater, et cetera, but there needs to be some costing taken into account where this tiny home is a lot coming from that that stays affordable because that's the place I'm finding. And that's where that intermediary where I mentioned about that micro life nonprofit and that's where Waikato Housing Initiative is, is the same. We basically need intermediary bodies that represent certain demographics that aren't market, don't have a big buffer of commercial profit built in to be able to absorb all those costs. So the intermediary is able to do that as a not-for-profit who's got mission to look after certain members of the community that are trying to meet their housing needs that's not getting met in any other way. So that's where I'm trying also to convince councils 
to step up into recognizing the third sector and to playing more of an enabling role and not just putting that regulatory same um, system onto what is a, a demographic or a sector that is not the same. And that's where that and, education and, piece comes in as well. And, and that works. I mean, the example you gave before of a whole new chapter effectively within the district plan of the council for an eco village it's that sort of concept and and councils have got examples of that with for example retirement homes so it's now accepted that when you have a retirement village that each of those little dwellings is not like a, a normal house you know it's much denser you're allowed to have multiple titles on or multiple homes within the same village setbacks are different the shading rules all that sort of stuff is different and and the contributions that they make per dwelling is also different it's the hueys they call them housing equivalent units so they pay like a half mm. a huey or less per each dwelling than than if it was a house in its own right so i think that is a good way to think of it it's is to have a like an eco village or a co-housing chapter that recognizes that third sector. And then it's there for anyone mm -hmm. to pull on that chapter for wherever they are, their particular project is, anywhere in the broader region. So you're not having to renegotiate over and over and over again for each project. It's about having a, a system change so that that tool is now sitting there for anybody to pick it up if it fits their particular project or development. Absolutely. Oh, great. I'm excited. Hopefully the housing initiative will be considering that. No, it's on our radar, yeah. And, <laughs> and your and, menu and was, of options. Yeah, and that's what it's about. And and again, it doesn't require any government legislation change. Councils have the right to do that now, should they wish to. Inclusionary zoning is something we need to touch on as well. Oh, so let's we... let's go there. I'm so keen. <laughs> Inclusionary zoning is one of those things that is a game changer, and yet councils are too afraid, I think, is the main thing, which is why it hasn't been taken up. I say afraid. Maybe that's not the case. What do you think has kept inclusionary zoning from being taken up by more councils, where the price of land or access to it is one of the main inhibitors? And what is it about WIPA that decided that it was a route that it could, it could do. Right. So, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Inclusionary zoning basically comes from the principle that when a land, when a piece of land is changed from rural to some form of residential, there is generally a massive uplift in value, right, that happens at that time because, and that's why developers will land bank. They'll try and work out where's the Where's urban sprawl going next? I'm going to buy that bit of land at a rural rate, the farm rate, and then I might lease it back to the farmer and wait and just wait for the town to come to me. And at the point at which the council rezones that land, there's a massive uplift in value. And that's generally actually where a lot of the value is made. That actually funds a lot of the subsequent development. So the whole point of inclusionary zoning is that, well, actually only the council, only the community can change the zoning. The community via the council changes the zoning. That's a, that's a gift only the community itself can give. And if everything was going hunky-dory, that's fine. But when we've got a housing crisis, maybe a little bit of that gift, 10%, 20% of that gift, that uplift, needs to stay with the community. That's kind of a, the philosophical way to, to, to put it. So whether that's money that's yielded, reflecting the uplift, or whether it's actual titles, so sections within that development uh, that's then passed back to council, for council either to do something with directly or perhaps to put into a lands trust, which might itself do something or might partner with someone like Habitat for Humanity or the wise group we've got up here or Bernardo's mm. or the Salvation, or it could be an eco-village. I mean, it doesn't really matter. The, the point is that that land would remain in community ownership in perpetuity. So it's now always available to do something in regards to affordable housing. And it's not winning the lottery for the first people who buy it, who then it's just theirs and they sell it at market price thereafter. The land itself would remain, and possibly the dwelling, depending on the model, would remain in the ownership of the lands trust, ensuring perpetual affordability. 
Yeah, what I really love about that model is it really does marry beautifully with the Maori philosophy of yes. stewardship, yes. caretaking yep. of the earth rather than ownership, and that land is for all of us, and the ecosystem doesn't know a land boundary, and, and that yes. is something for all of us to steward and caretake, and it's intergenerational. So I really love that model that, although it has a modern kind of sound to it, yes. it actually is quite a, a, a very indigenous way of yeah. of interacting with land and community well that's right and and we've seen examples uh, too within the district of uh, maori freehold land where the owners of that land would never ever wish to sell it but they may want to contribute to a housing solution so they could do almost what we might in modern language call a license to occupy where somebody has the right to put their tiny home or a permanent dwelling onto that piece of whenua even though they don't talk a papa to that land, but they never ever have the right to, to buy it. It's not their land. Mm -hmm. It's they have a license to occupy it for a particular period of time in return for a rent repayment, which gives an income to the owners of that land as well. So yeah, I think it, it is a good model. Now, why is it not just a tax on developers? Right. So that's when when you come into the why why are councils a bit reluctant, it seems, to to take this on. Mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily something that developers would would wrap their arms around and and, and sing to the heavens for, right? Because it, it <laughs> represents a loss of margin, a loss of profit. So the Waikato Housing Initiative is very much of the view, remembering my earlier comment that 90% uh, of the market is delivered by private developers. So you need to work with them, you need to understand what works from their perspective. We need to put the, if you call that a stick, then you, there needs to be some carrots as well. And actually we have a number of carrots. Council has a number of carrots. Government have a number of carrots, which we can use to, to address that, that perceived loss, a real or perceived loss. For example, maybe you only upzone if there's some integrated affordability as part of it. Otherwise, you hang on to that piece of land that you bought for as long as you like, but the zoning doesn't get changed. That's obviously a, a lever. But also the amount of density that you can achieve on the rest of the land. Maybe there's a greater density than would normally be allowed if some of it's affordable. That's real money. That's additional yield that makes a big difference to the developer. As we know, density can't be achieved without three waters connectivity, in particular water uh, potable water and wastewater. Maybe priority is given to which development gets the pipes because there's never just one developer active, there's a number. So if you've got affordability integrated, we come to you first. How about that? Maybe there's a new funding arrangements, for example, the infrastructure funding, uh, the IFF, mm. you see already, that basically says rather than the council carrying the cost of that new infrastructure on its books or the developer having to pay for it up front, maybe there's a government uh, funding tool that's available, which it still has to be paid for, and it still gets leveraged over time against the sections, but it's not a capital hurdle right up front that has to be dealt with then. It could be dealt with like patient capital. And, mm -hmm. and patient capital at 3 or 4% interest. Savings. It's a huge. Maybe there's an offset in DCs. The development contribution yep. maybe is lower. And we've got some jurisdictions like Tauranga, for example, where the developer pays the DC in the normal way. But then if it's a chip, then at the point at which the chip takes over, the DC is returned to the chip, not to the developer, which assists oh, right. them. That assist that, that makes sure it's a bit like the GST on fresh food sort of argument. How can you be sure that the money ends up where it's supposed to? Mm -hmm. And we've got a list of about three pages of a whole range of initiatives, fast track consenting, a concierge service for developers with integrated affordability. So you're not dealing with 15 different people in right. council. You deal with one and they find out who the other 14 are, right? But that's only available where you've got integrated affordability. You know, so there's a whole right. range of things. Bulk yeah. consenting. So if you've got multiple dwellings that are all the same, not having to do an individual building consent for each and every house, but maybe you do one that covers 20 houses because they're all the same. They just cite it slightly differently on, on the section. That's, again, a massive cost saving by cutting out red tape.
because I always imagine inclusionary zoning as being imposed and it being a little bit like begrudgingly. But I'm hearing with all the levers that you're talking about, of which there's actually quite a large amount of these carrots, that folks could even opt in to, yeah. I, yeah, this is great. I've got a piece of land. Let's let's go. I'll do some inclusionary zoning. I'm, I'm really excited then about this, all these opportunities that it gives to people to voluntarily enter in. And so is, were you saying in terms of council's reluctance was that perhaps they didn't see this wide a range of benefits of being something that the developers would find so attractive that they'd only want to fight it and that it could end up as a legal mm -hmm. case and we don't have the money or time to deal with this backlash. Yeah, yeah. And so we're not going to yeah. go there, but they haven't seen enough how it's worked positively to so that it feels too risky yeah I, I suspect so and also there is there is a big pushback from developers initially as they don't understand necessarily what the benefits could be and so queenstown is the one that's that's sort of first in the, in the country to do it and they've actually been doing it on a voluntary basis since about 07 and they've got something like 54 million dollars as i understand it with the property now and the lands trust down there which is an amazing achievement they also have the worst housing prices in the country, right? So imagine without that, what it would have been. <laughs> so they did it because if you think back to the States, actually, Aspen is another example that's quoted very, very often, where you've got four, five, six, seven million dollar holiday homes, and then they'd all want to go down and, and have a meal at a restaurant with a minimum wage a server or a coffee from a barista on minimum wage. And they can't live anywhere because it's completely unaffordable for them to be in that community and get the community who needs them, right? So it's that Queenstown saw themselves going that way and, and, and introduced this. They've come a long way. They're now seeking to introduce it formally as part of the district plan. So like not on a voluntary basis, but, you know, uh, imposed, as to use your word. And they've had about 700 submissions against it. <laughs> yeah. I was involved a bit in that submission of the more, more current one. And I remember... Right them making it clear that we're excluding people right. who've got slightly larger backyard sections where they see putting three or four homes for the purpose of affordability, right? We're opening it up in a small way. We don't have a big buffer. I remember that being as part of the submission so that it's really around the more larger for-profit right. where there's a, usually a fairly large wealth um, creation aspect and allowing still for the, let's just call it a backyard development, still to be there affordably, because that's what they were trying to do is make it available for yeah. affordability's sake. So yeah, I think that's important to note note about inclusionary zone. It's it's not yeah, for every, so. every house that's built. It's really got a certain kind of a development that it's targeting. And it only works where there's growth. Right. So yeah. if you've got if you've got a town that's fairly static, its population is not expected to grow by a lot over the next 10 years, 20 years. And that's the case for a lot of small town New Zealand, actually, once you get distant from the big centers. But where there's growth, it's a really powerful lever. And so coming back to why part, why then? Well, they've got off the scale growth. I mean, their growth is through the roof. Mm -hmm. And affordability is becoming you know, worse and worse and worse. Like it's really worsening very, very significantly there. They can see themselves now on the Queenstown path, but they've got the opportunity with development still coming on stream to say, this is when we need to introduce that new tool. We need to be brave. We need to stand up on behalf of, a, of our community, which is increasingly distressed by unavailability of rentals, unaffordability of rentals, and the inability to purchase, we need to intervene before we get as bad as Queenstown, who are on the way to, to being an Aspen. <laughs> so that's why they went first, because of the growth. And it's would you say that either you or the housing initiative had some hand in either assisting oh, I, them with the, either the documentation or in terms of really seeing the benefit? What what role did you and the absolutely. housing initiative play? Yeah, so and, and that's six years before I... I stepped into this role. I mean, this was one of the things I identified early. And and on behalf of the housing initiative, Thomas Gibbons in particular, our, our property our lawyer specialist, really the, the thinking of how it might be introduced up here in the Waikato. And, and through the recent medium density hearings, the sort of three by three RMA Amendment Act uh, that was uh, brought in by government, 
uh, the three councils up here, Hamilton uh, City, Waikato and Waipa, jointly held hearings around that. Uh, and Thomas led a joint submission uh, on behalf of a number of parties, including the Lands Trust and, and the WHI, um, to say, hey, we should be thinking about inclusionary zoning as part of uh, these new um, medium uh, residential uh, density standards. That was actually ruled out of scope by the commissioners after lots of arguments backwards and forwards. So they didn't comment on the merits of it. They were just saying, as notified, Mm -hmm. This was really not inside the scope and therefore others didn't have the opportunity to reflect on it and provide mm -hmm. their input. So it would have to be dealt with in a different way. And that's that was around about the time when I came in. So all of that work had been done to get to there, but it was now on everyone's radar. And councils were very deliberate actually in saying, we have not taken a view on the merits of this. This ruling is not a reflection on merit. It's just, it's not in scope. So that's the, around about the point where I came in, and what we did since then is we actually drafted a chapter, uh, uh, a district plan chapter, that reflected the Queenstown provisions to, to say to councils, hey, if we're going to go on this in a separate forum, we should not start all from zero and everyone get their own chapter. We should be aligned so that we have um, consistency in the way those provisions might work certainly around the future proof sort of region, the, the Hamilton, Waikato, Waipa area, Matamatapiaka. And so we drafted that up and we presented it to those councils. And we must have got it about right because I've actually taken that as the starting point and Waipa were then first to say, right, we're doing it. We actually got to notify this. Uh, Hamilton City have also indicated their desire to do so, probably again in a joint hearing. Uh, but that hasn't formally been adopted uh, as a council position at this point. But they've certainly made some very positive noises in public forum uh, about that and, uh, and and the relevance of that tool, because they, of course, also have a lot of growth, although their growth is mostly infill as opposed to, you know, so mm. it's, it's existing houses being torn down inside the city and a, and a greater density being built in its place versus mm. Cambridge, which is more green fields. So there is a, a mm. slight difference on, on how to approach it. Mm. So yeah, that's really what's driven up here. That's what's given them the courage is that if they don't do it now, then potentially we just miss that opportunity for the current things that are here. And hey, look, if you're a developer and if you are asking the public first to in some way contribute or council to in some way enable, facilitate, get you your poop pipes quicker, not ask you to, to wait in line, but fast track your consents and all the rest of it, which is stuff that's commercially relevant for you. Well, if you are asking for that support, maybe there's something that goes the other way. I'm here in the Nelson Tasman district and I'm seeing the need. Um, Tasman has a lot of rural areas, but there's a lot of growth. So there's a lot of potential and there's no housing strategy for either one of the councils. And there's not a lot of cohesiveness, I would say. So I'm quite interested in promoting the housing initiative idea that Waikato has used to be able to gather data, to be able to show the need where the gaps are, to be able to have that uh, cohesive working together and to be able to really take that local government leadership approach to be able to make those levers to look at where they can play a part. Because at the moment, the conversations I'm having, it's pretty minimal in terms of where local government sees it can play, the impact it feels like it can have and all the conversations where I'm asking them to basically step it up a little bit. Yeah, I would perhaps invite, if I'm able to bring you into a conversation with council folks from around these two areas, so that we're able to talk about a housing initiative, what it could look like, and using the example that you've been involved in, if I could use your experience and expertise, um, I'd love to see it, of course, around the country, which is why I'm interviewing you right. today, because I believe it's something that so valuable and bringing local government really into their place of power and how, how you've done it is a great model. Yeah. Well, I think that the, the first step is the most difficult one. And that is for council to say, actually, this is our job. It's not, a, should we do it, should we not? We talked about the future of local government review panel. Their report is out. That talks about affordable housing as being what they recommend to be one of the roles of government going forward. 
the third part of the RMA replacement bill, the natural and built environment, mentions affordable housing as a required system outcome. That's never been there before. It's never been a system outcome. It's now stated as being required. That's not an act. It's a bill, right? So it's got to make its way through. But that's new. That's different. And the well-being is coming back into the uh, Local Government Act is another example of a mm -hmm. clear direction being given by central government to local government to say, you need to think about this as part of your mandate. Part of the things we're asking you to do on behalf of your community includes well-beings and housing is at the core of so many mm -hmm. well-beings, mm -hmm. right? And so many outcomes for, for families. So the first step is the biggest and that's getting councils effectively to say, yeah, actually, this is our job. Nobody else is doing this, mm -hmm. and we are best mm -hmm. place to lead. So that's number one. Number two, and that's been part of the success of the Waikato Housing Initiative, you then eventually must return to government because they sit mm -hmm. on some of those funding streams mm -hmm. that are important mm -hmm. to make the whole thing go, right? But you now come back saying, here's a program of housing we need a program of funding, not lolly scrambles, not things that come and go and open and close and random things. We need over a decade, a politically, mm -hmm. and we need certainty mm -hmm. of what's being funded, what mm -hmm. you'll bring to it. And what we found here, actually, this is again before I started, what we found is that when we went to government and said, we are speaking on behalf of the region, we are speaking on behalf of the continuum, private developers, chips, close relationship with MSD, Kainga Aura, retirement home, all the way, all of it. We speak for all of it. They sort of said, well, yeah, not sure we believe you. And they went back as they do and they talked to developers and they talked to chips and they got the same message. They got the same answer back because we've done the work to actually have a whole continuum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. aligned about, hey, this is what we're going to do. And this is the support we need from Central in order to achieve it. And that made a difference because now you're you're going to government effectively saying, here's a solution and we'll carry the can for it, but you, you just need to fund it. That's, it's and the it's things that you want to yep. fund anyway. These are things that you exactly. want to fund. Exactly. Yes, yeah. exactly. And that future of local government report. And yeah, there's some really beautiful quotes around the fact that a lot of money that has been taken by central really needs to go back to local government because a lot of these things that we need to see will be able to happen more engagement and supporting of local communities aspirations when that funding is channeled so it really does speak to that channeling of funding back down to local government so it doesn't feel like its hands are tied and the only way it has to make any money is rates where it's hit its maximum. So it's very exciting that Future of Local Government report really does say what its role is and hopefully has that funding to back it. So mm -hmm. with what we're asking councils to do, hopefully they'll make that request then for the funding to do what they yeah. see, see is in the best interest of their community. That's right. But we don't need yeah. to wait. We don't yeah. need to wait, right? Because in the meanwhile... No. They've got no, I don't so think so. Give us, you know, but we just need to get on with it. And so I get a bit grumpy with strategies, not because you shouldn't have strategies, but strategy is also an excuse for not doing anything just yet because you're waiting for the strategy to be produced by an external consultant. Um, we've had that five or six years of, uh, uh, as a region of making sure we understood, held a commonly shared mm. definition of the problem and the solutions. And now we don't need any more strategies. Now we need to do it. And okay, maybe we need to do a review in two or three or five years to make sure that everything mm. is working as intended. But for now, let's just do the things that we know to do. That's why I'm here. That's why we've got the action, shift the action mode is because let's just do the things we know will work. We know will have an impact. Yes. And then once momentum is going, once we've started seeing actual dwellings, then okay, maybe then you pause and reflect. But for now, let's just keep going. Ah, that is really fantastic to hear that not sit around and wait to approach and that local government can do what it can do. So mm -hmm. thank you for that final message. That's really a great way to end the great message that I'm going to bring to my local uh, area. 
and have those discussions because that's what it is. I'm meeting actually with a counselor on Friday. I did raise my concern around housing strategy and delivery and all the rest in this area that I know is lacking. And I got a response from a staff member saying, no, it's fine. We got everything. And yet that's not what I'm hearing from the local community. I kind of spread that message out to all the counselors and the mayor. And I said, I'm really concerned. This is not true. And so the counselor said, yes, I'll meet with you and hear what you have to say. And so for me, it's just going to be now rolling out these conversations with the two councils and counselors and as many staff as I can get to meet with to get to get them on board. So seeing that you've done it in Wai in the Waikato, it's working well and we could do it here. So Absolutely. thank you so much for meeting with me today for the positive message that you have for all the work that you've been doing. I'll put a link to the Waikato Housing yeah. Initiative website because yeah. there's so Please much do. on there in terms yeah. of what other regions can do to collect data and on what particular areas. And, and how they can create a local website for our area as well. And I know that yeah. the regional um, council did fund quite a bit of that back work, you know, of creating the website and having some administrative staff. I think that's really important to recognize that that was an yeah. important piece of getting it yeah. all going. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And actually the White so, yeah. Wellbeing Project sponsored and continue mm -hmm. to sponsor the dashboards. So it, it is important to have data-driven discussions and the conversations should go from there. And, and I think it, that the depth of the crisis is pretty clear to see. It's it's laid out pretty bare when you look at the data, you know, median incomes versus median prices for rents or, or um, purchasing. MSD waiting lists, you know, all of that is it's pretty stark. So let's start with that. And then the conclusions that we need to do something kind of leap off the page. Mm. That's right. Can't turn away. So thank you so much for all that work and for meeting with me today to share your story. Thank you. Bye. Uh, 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 uh.